Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Applied Epic Spring Cleaning, Correcting Company and Broker Configuration and Data. We are excited to see so many familiar names from previous sessions joining us today. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. For those of you joining us for the first time today and may not be uh, familiar with what Kite Technology is all about, we are a managed IT service provider and consulting firm servicing independent insurance agencies and other businesses across the country. We've been around for more than 30 years now, and what sets Kite Tech apart from other IT providers is our expertise within the insurance industry. Many of our staff have previous backgrounds working in insurance, giving us that extra insight on what agencies today require to operate at a high level. Listed here, you can see some of the IT and consulting services we offer. If you'd like to learn more about our services, please send us a message to the Q&A panel and we'll be sure to reach out to you. So let's meet our consulting team here with us today. I'm Kelly Halfpap, agency consultant at Kite Tech. I've been with Kite for a little over three years, but worked within the insurance industry as a CSR and account manager for five years before that. At Kite, I primarily handle Epic accounting support, which includes accounting training, data entry, and uh, data assessments and cleanup. Now I'll give it over to Lauren. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Roberts, the director of our agency consulting team here at Kite Technology Group, one of the best teams in the world. Uh, and I, uh, I work with clients uh, on ep epic optimization projects, migrations, um, accounting, forensic accounting, lots of fun, huh? And uh, and I've been with the, the company since 2017. I was actually one of our second consultants to join. Uh, and I also have lots of years of experience in insurance uh, in my background as well. All right, now our main event, Jenny, uh, go ahead and, and let, us, uh, let us get this kicked off. That's so funny. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Honigan. I'm an agency consultant as well. I've been with Kite since April of last year, so I'm coming up on my one-year anniversary. Before that, I um, was a, a CSR in um, crop insurance, did that for a while, and then was the Epic Administrator at our agency. So um, that's my background. Let's go right into our agenda for today. So today we're going to talk to you about identifying um, the differences between a PPE and an ICO. Uh, we're going to show you how to enter a company and broker accounts and the difference between the two and all the different fields that you need to enter to have your data um, accurate. We'll show you briefly how to co configure commission agreements. Um, we'll show you how to correct your configuration and in interface. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lauren, and she is going to clean up the GL sub accounts for you and do the next, next steps and how we can help you. And then at the end, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A time. Um, there is a Q&A, like Kelly said, um, so we'll answer questions as we go as well. All right, let's jump right in. Um, so ICO and PPE, what's the difference? And um, I know it sounds it sounds a little weird. Um, we are working in insurance and we know, but sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's a little confusing. So the ICO is your issuing company. That's the company that's actually writing the policy. Now, sometimes with your smaller carriers, this is going to be the same as, as the main company. But um, with your bigger carriers like Travelers, um, they usually have a writing company um, like that. Um, it can be separate. It can be the same. And the download, when it downloads, it's going to send the, um, it sends the NAIC code of the issuing company. So that's why we want to keep these straight. One of the reasons we want to keep them straight. All right. And then your PPE is your premium payable entity or also called the billing company. Um, this is who pays the agency. It's the entity that accounting uses when they're on their general ledger side that most of us never see. Um, and they enter in who they've received this commission money from. Um, it can be a company or it can be a broker. And um, we're going to enter our commission agreement on the PPE level. So you don't have to worry about configuring them for every single writing company. All right. So why does this matter? I kind of mentioned for downloads. Um, all, but our number one answer is always ENO. We always want to make sure that our data is correct that um, we have indicated who is writing 
um, what what they've said that they're writing, you know, which company is writing um, for us. We want our certificates correct. We want our evidences correct, auto IDs. We want those to have the, the correct company that has issued the policy. Um, again, with downloads, we want to make sure that they're correct. Um, we want our accounting to be correct. So you want to make sure that the PPE is correct on there um, so that your um, accounting, your general ledger and your chart of accounts or your statements, um, um, your monthly uh, statements, your P&Ls are all great. And then for reporting as well, you want to be able to quantify how much business you have with each carrier. All right. And all right, so how do you know which is which? Because your paper just says travelers. You look at your deck page and you see travelers and you see the umbrella, but you see here I've highlighted um, the issuing company on this deck page is Travelers Property Casualty Company of America. So um, this is this in this case, in your policy, you would want to have an entry for Travelers Property Casualty Company of America as the ICO, and then the PC. PPE would be just travelers. Another place we can look up is the um, NAIC lookup, and I'm going to switch over to that really quick, this website that you can go to. And there's the, the web link, and if you come over here, you can enter in the company name. You see travelers will have a lot. Um, these are the issuing companies over here, and then um, Oh, I didn't hit enter. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know why that didn't work. There we go. So this will pull up every company that has the word travelers in it. You can look over here for the issuing company and then see the, um, the company information over here to maybe give you an idea of who the, the PPE is. And this is a very simplified website that we use just for quick reference. Um, most agencies have access to AMBEST, which will have all of the same information, um, in addition to that AMBEST rating that, that you're looking for. Um, Ginny, one thing I wanted to, to interject real quick, this came up the other day for me, yeah. is that um, <clears throat> some companies that are requesting certificates are really starting to crack down on the NAIC codes. So that's actually how um, one agency found that they were missing some, NA some issuing companies and the NAIC codes with those companies it's because the information was coming out incorrectly on their certificate. So, you know, getting these things in order, when we say it's important on proofs, it is very important on proofs because some of these folks that are requesting certificates with specific contracts and all kinds of stuff, they're really cracking down on, on the level of detail. Um, I did want to point out too, that in addition to the company name, you can look up by the code because sometimes you will have the code. We'll show you that in a minute. Um, 25674 is one I wanted to look up. And there's our Travelers Property Casualty of America and, um, and it's with Travelers. Switch back over. All right, so other ways to know, ask your accounting administrator who's paying us, um, especially when it comes to, P to PPE, ask them, uh, look on your commission statement if you have access to a commission statement or ask your underwriter. All right, so let's identify some of these companies for cleanup. We know something's not quite right. Where can we go to look? Um, one of the best places to go is to look at your book of business report. And here I've got a snapshot of one. And you look over in this far corner, ICO and PPE are the same. And this is for travelers. And so we know that they travelers is, is usually has a different writing company. So we want to identify those and make sure that those have been, um, all of the issuing companies have been entered in EPIC, but then also our policies are updated as well. Um, we'll get to it in a minute, but there is a setting to make sure that your download will update the issuing company for you. Uh, you can also look, um, this is a snapshot of a pivot table that I did. I've dumped the book of business into Excel. Um, I don't want to get into pivot tables right now. Um, Daniel with Kite has just done uh, released a great video on pivot tables. Go find it on the YouTube channel, and he'll show you how to run it. But this can show you um, your main companies here, and then you can do a count and and see what your uh, what you have in your data. 
And then also you can um, go to the account section of reports and run a company list report and look at all of your active companies. Um, do you even write with these? You know, go down through the list. Do you write with them? And then do you have brokers entered as companies? In our demo data, we have Burns and Wilcox entered as a company. So we'll show you how to fix that in a minute. And then the last thing is you can manipulate your communication log. Um, when you go to the, um, in the reports and marketing area, when you go to the interface, um, interface reports, there's a policy received report that you can get a list of who actually downloads. It has the NEIC company or code listed on the report. It's going to give you an, um, a, a, a detailed list of every thing that has downloaded, every policy that is downloaded. I usually put pick six months to a year and then take out the detail and summarize. Again, you have to be a little savvy with reports to do that. Um, but this will show you if you put in um, one PPE, um, if you want to see, um, if you put in the PPE of travelers, here are all the issuing companies that are actually downloading into your system, and you can go and make sure they've all been entered pro properly. Okay. And then you can always look on the configure and configure on the interface section and the company broker and go down to one of your major carriers like Travelers, you're gonna have an NAIC tab. And here you can see I have several issuing companies listed under Travelers. These actually need to be split out and entered as their own individual issuing companies. Because like I said, the download is gonna send this code, it's gonna send 10647. And because um, we're telling Epic that 10647 is just Travelers, then it's going to assign the issuing company as just travelers. And then it's going to do the same thing for 10785, 19224, et cetera. Yeah. And Jenny, before you navigate away from that screen, we actually had a question come in um, okay. regarding uh, the suspense saying that there was a missing NAIC code. Um, and so that's why the that's why the download couldn't come in for a certain policy download. That's right. That's right. If you're if you're reviewing your error reports, and I do have a screenshot of that in a little bit too, um, this is where you will enter it, and this is where the download reads. If it's a company, if it's a broker, it's going to actually read it on the broker account, and I'll show you that too. Mm -hmm. um, and just wanted to add in another um, note here from our questions. Um, <clears throat> there is there anywhere else that the NAIC code might be connected that could be causing an issue with um, with download coming in? Um, not that I know of. I know there's one other place to enter the NAIC code. And Lauren, you have more experience, so you might you might be able to correct me. But it's my understanding that this is where the the interface yeah. sends the NAIC code. It is. It is. Yep. Can't think of anything else. So we might have to send Laura to apply, to, unfortunately, to get her, her <laughs> question answered by support if it's stuck somewhere else. <laughs> All right. All right. And then um, we can also, uh, another place we can look in direct bill commission suspense, um, when you're under um, procedures, interface management, and you've got that batch, you can see here, all of these are the same batch ID number. So these should all this this reflects the payment or the transactions from one carrier from one PPE, and you see over in the PPE column there's actually two different PPEs. Um, you want to make sure that you are able that you um, that they're all the same PPE. If you process this, it's going to create two statements for you: one for NATI04 and one for COLC01, and you don't want that. You want them all to be the same PPE. Um, I always like to click on the column headers and sort and like kind of float the outliers to the top. If you correct it on this screen here, then um, it will correct it for the transaction, but it will not correct it on the policy. So correct it so that um, if you're if you're processing download or direct bill commission suspense, you can get it on through, but make a note of those policies. If you have access, you can just do a little print right here um, and uh, and download it into Excel so that you have a, a list of the ones on there. All right, and 
if all else fails, ask accounting. Um, who's paying you? And uh, who are you paying premium to? And then call your carrier. Who am I actually appointed with? So these are some ways that you can uh, you can find out what's wrong and and how and uh, what needs to be fixed. All right. So let's walk through entering company and broker accounts. And like I said, they're a little bit different. Um, so you want to enter Burns and Wilcox as a broker, not as a company. Um, and let's flick over. Let's flick over, flick over to. Um, to um, Epic and we can enter in travelers and let's enter in that travelers that we pulled up earlier, which was Travelers Property Casualty Company of America. And so a lot of times what I like to do is just copy exactly what they have because your proofs are limited. And if you've got to abbreviate, just use the abbreviation that the NAIC code is using. And I don't have that one in there. So I'm going to click the plus, just like everything else. And then we're going to indicate that this is an issuing company. And our billing company is going to be the main travelers. If you know your code, you can type it and tab over. There we go. Um, and then we're going to enter in. I'm just pasting from the NAIC website and generate that code. And then I don't typically put the address and everything on the issuing company. I put it on the billing company. So um, if this is a smaller a smaller company and you're doing both, then put that here. But if you're just doing an issuing company for a larger company, then just leave it right there. Jenny, I think we should we should clarify that just a little bit because we're getting sure. a couple of questions about PPE versus issuing company. Um, <clears throat> so as far as like the NEIC is concerned, you know, maybe a couple of examples are helpful to understand um, what's the difference really. Um, so, you know, travelers, for example. Travelers is one of those companies that is not going to be an issuing company. You can just have travelers and that's your billing company for all of your little issuing companies with travelers. Um, but there are some sticky situations like with auto owners, for example. Um, auto owners also has auto owners as an issuing company. So technically you could use auto owners insurance company as an issuing and a billing company and not have to create two separate company codes for that. Um, some others are a little um, a little sticky there too, like Ber Berkshire Hathaway Companies has Berkshire Hathaway Company <laughs> as an issuing company. So, <clears throat> you know, it's sometimes it's just more streamlined to put them in as an issuing and a billing company instead of creating two separate companies for that. Um, so you can have, you know, like Jenny said earlier, um, a billing company that actually is an issuing company in addition to, to billing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna click detail rather than finish. And when we get our company issued, this is what we this is what we have um, entered on the front page. I like to go over to compliance and identification numbers, and this is the other place that you can enter an NIC code. And I like to do it not because download reads it, but because um, because this is the only place you're going to be able to report on it. Um, you can't in the interface reports you can't pull the NAIC code to see what you've configured, but you can pull it from here. So we're going to say in and um, let's see what was that number again two five six seven four. So we're just going to add it here, and there you go. And were we going to mention AM Best here, Lauren? Yes, yeah, and um, we actually just had a question from <clears throat> Carla asking about uh, should we put the F the FEIN, AM best number, and NAIC codes all in this area? Yes, absolutely. However, sometimes it might be a little bit hard to to maintain. So, you know, we we don't see every single agency putting all of that data in, but it is definitely a good best practice to to get that information on this screen. And you would just do that here as well. You can see in the drop down, there's AMBEST. And... Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
And since this is an issuing company, um, that is all I'm going to do with this one. So we've entered in our issuing company and I'm, and I'm done. Um, if you were going to be entering the main travelers, so, so we don't have a main travelers as the PPE. Um, if you want to enter that, you would do the same thing. But instead of checking issuing company, you would say billing company. And then you would just put in kind of your generic travelers here. And here's where I would put in the address. Um, in the contact section, I would put in your underwriter, your um, your marketing rep, just everybody that you might have have need of a contact for, where to send claims, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, put that in there. And then it's the, it's the exact same account there. And then the next thing that we need to do is um, let's show you how to enter a broker since we're on the screen, but we're not finished entering travelers. But I, I do want to, since we're going to the same place after we enter the broker, I'll, I'll do this now. So let's enter in. Um, we saw that Birds and Wilcox was in as a, as a company. So what we want to do is actually inactivate that as a company. Um, that's our first step. Oops. And Lauren will show you the, the next, um, but we want to inactivate. She'll show you the next thing that you need to do with the general ledger. Um, and then we can just say entered an error. There we go. And now it's inactivated. Um, and then we drop down and we're going to enter it as a broker. And hit plus just the same way that we've been doing um, all of our other accounts in Epic. I feel like Michael Jordan, I got to hold my mouth just right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. All right. So here, um, one of the one of the ways that we can tell at a glance if it's a broker or a company is that brokers have the dash and then the subcode on there. Um, so that's kind of a quick indicator. Um, one of the things that we didn't mention that we were going to mention as well is that um, if you're entering a PPE, it might be a, it's a best practice to enter the, the PPEs in in all caps. That way you can tell at a glance what's your PPE or what's your issuing company. So we can do that. Um, again, I would enter in all of the detailed information here because this is Burns is going to be the one to pay you. Um, if you need to limit by type of business, certainly do that. If it's Blue Cross, don't check, you know, P and C lines. Just go ahead and limit it to life and health or benefits. Mm -hmm. And then you can further limit it down here when you associate it just to different departments. Um, that keeps your drop down list um, smaller for your servicing staff, and it just kind of funnels the, um, the data in the right place. And we're going to go to detail instead of finish. Epic wants us to go to finish. It put it in bright blue for us, but we want to go to detail. And here's our um, here's our uh, our billing tab here. If anything needs to be changed, I I don't usually change these. Um, but if you need it, if you don't want it to be on renewal, if they're if they're leaving your area and you you can uncheck this. Um, the account is where we just filled out over there. And then um, over here on accounting. So this, um, you're wanting to, um, you're wanting to indicate some brokers are brokers. They write the business for you and then, um, and then they take the commission out. They send you your commission. They act like a carrier. Some brokers are like bird dogs and they just, you know, you give them a, you give them a commission. So they're commissionable brokers. Um, it, it depends on um, on what your relationship is with that. So if you're going to be billing, Lauren, you're going to have to help me with this. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, before this, I stagger over. <laughs> yeah, this is where it's really important to make sure that you get your um, accounting check boxes set up correctly because you don't want the broker showing up in the wrong places and brokers truly are completely different entities from companies so like jenny was saying um if you have somebody that is outside your agency they're not an employee but they're producing business for you they're going to be commission payable but a burns and wilcox for example that you're writing business with 
they're not going to be commission payable. We don't want them to show up in a PRBR tab ever. So they're not going to, we're not going to check that box for them. Then you also have brokers that, you know, maybe you're a wholesaler and you're going to bill this broker for the premium that they're supposed to gather and send to you and then you send their commission back or maybe they keep their commission and just send you the rest. So that's when you're going to use that receivable option um, and you'll combine that with bill broker net if that's a feature that you want to use. Um, that's definitely not one of the most common selections. So it is specific to specific types of agencies. Um, mo more commonly, we would see commission payable for those outside producers or premium payable. That one's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> so we write business with a carrier broker, um, sorry, with a broker. That's when they're going to be the, um, the premium payable. Now, the receives 1099 form checkbox is typically selected in conjunction with the commission payable. Um, and if you actually want their broker payable commission to post to the general ledger as they are earning commission, then you would also check that automatically post to GL checkbox. That can get you in trouble if you are just checking it and you don't know what's happening in the background. Um, so make sure you only check that if you know that it's going to generate a payable account, payable GL account for your, your broker so that you can debit that um, when you pay them whatever it is that, that they're owed. Um, and you'll also see that with every broker that's entered, there is a GL sub account that create, that's created automatically as soon as a broker is created. Awesome. And that also creates on the PPE as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before you guys continue, could you uh, clarify, we're getting a couple questions about a parent company. Could you clarify exactly what a parent company is in relation to the PPE or ICO? So your parent company is really similar to, um, to a billing company. It, it's it's kind of muddy to see the difference between. Um, I look at something like USLI, for example. Hopefully everybody's familiar with that one. Um, so USLI would be a parent company because they are a billing company and they have issuing companies under them, but they also have Mount Vernon under them, which is also billing. So that's where you have that, that parent company. Most of the time, your main billing company is who the parent company is as well. Auto owners is going to be auto owners. Travelers is going to be travelers. Progressive is going to be progressive. And the list goes on and on. All right. Um, I did I did see a question in there about determining agency bill and direct bill on a broker. And we did not show that on the company, but there is a radio button on there. I don't know. I, the the um, agency bill is the receivable, right? That's where you you check this box. Yeah, so for, that it's agency bill mm -hmm, for a broker. Um, okay. If okay. if the broker is going to be billing an agency for whatever they're writing with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then under compliance and identification numbers, um, this is where I told you that you have to enter in. Um, this is where you enter, and this is where if a broker downloads which is very, you know, pretty rare, but happens, um, you would want to enter their NPN number here. And so if you see that on your um, error reports that, um, that this policy hasn't downloaded because it's missing the NPN number, you would just enter it right here. And this is where interface would, um, would read and, and attach. Oh, I think I might've misunderstood that. How do you determine agency bill and direct bill on a broker? Um, they're automatically agency and direct bill as soon as you click premium payable. Um, so you can use brokers interchangeably on agency bill or direct bill. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then um, a lot of you in your drop down list, you will see your um, companies in bright red, italicized, bold names, and it's irritating. Um, <laughs> this is the fat cut. And it's because you have not yet determined shown up showing up so you just want to say not applicable if you're not reporting that way um and that'll make your um make your companies look just bold and and, mm -hmm. and black instead of in red um, um wanted to go back I, jenny i don't know if you mentioned this already or not but types of business offered is one of our other questions coming through so um question was should you uncheck the ones that don't apply yeah, I touched on it a little bit in um, 
And th that's a good way to, to funnel your data into the correct place. That's where I said Blue Cross, you would want to uncheck everything except benefits and life and health. Um, it, it gets a little tricky because sometimes auto owners kind of goes everywhere, you know, just, yeah. just do it for business. Um, I made the mistake in the agency that I worked at, at at super funneling it. And just like everywhere else in Epic, if you super funnel it, then somebody's going to need something and you're going to be putting out a lot of fire. So just, you know, do your homework and make sure you know what you're doing or make sure you know, um, not what you're doing. Of course, you know what you're doing, but make sure you know, um, you know, what effects it has on you. Thank you. All right. So we went through entering a company and entering a broker. Mm -hmm. So in interface configuration, and our demo does not have interface, so I just have to show you screenshots. But um, the last step, once you've entered any new company, whether it's an issuing company, billing company, whatever, you want to come over here to um, configure interface and company broker. And a lot of you with newer databases will have this default interface company, which is awesome and perfect. Um, if you don't have this, you have an older database, just use your top, um, whoever the top um, the, uh, um, carrier is, just or broker, whatever, just the top entry. Um, and you want to come to, um, this one should be fully configured out. When you enter a new, um, when you enter a new um, company or broker, it's not going to have any of your interface configuration. So you just want to come over here to actions, copy interface setup. And then when you get to that, you'll get this pop-up box. And I wanted to point out, um, we typically say copy set up to all and we check all here. But uh, Laura showed me last week that you, if you drop down this arrow, um, you can actually just pick just the issuing companies with that same billing company. So instead of, instead of if you started um, just with travelers, instead of starting with that download that I showed you on the previous screen, um, if you have um, unique configurations per company, then you can do that. But typically we just say select all um, over here, select all, it'll check the boxes for you. And then um, at the bottom of that screen, you just wanna check everything. I saved myself four clicks because I've never come across an agency that uses automated download invoicing. Mm -hmm. If you're using it, check it, but I'm saving myself, you know, um, trigger finger problems in the future and by those four clicks there. Um, and uh, just copy them all that way. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not huge fans of um, ADI, so yeah. <laughs> it's a cool we're concept also, if, yeah. if you ever get it to work properly. <laughs> we're also huge fans of counting the clicks, as they say. Yes. All right. So the last thing you want to do after you've copied the configuration is go down to your to your carrier that you've actually entered and you want to highlight it, um, either double click or single click the pencil and go to the NAIC. And here is where you will enter the NAIC code. You're just going to click the plus and then enter, um, enter that um, in there. And then the same thing, if you have your, your generic travelers with a bunch of codes in there, just highlight the codes you don't need and click the X and then go through and enter all the company you know, enter the issuing companies that you're actually receiving. Sometimes the carrier will send you when you go, um, when you first get download with them, they'll send you this huge packet, this download packet, and they'll send you a list of all the 180 issuing companies that they use. Um, they're, you, you're not going to write with all those. So just ask your, ask your um, underwriter which ones you're actually appointed with that you're, that they're going to be using with you, or um, just you can do it from your download reports. All right, so now we touched on a little bit. Here's correcting the NAIC configuration in the interface. So you've come across Travelers and it has all of these codes here. So um, you want to identify which companies have your multiple NAIC codes and these need to be split out. Um, you're going to look them up on the NAIC website and see exactly which one it is. Um, you want to delete the code from here and then go back through and enter them as a new ICO with Travelers as the billing company. 
And then you want to go back to configure, copy the settings, and then enter the NAIC code for the new, um, the new issuing company that you just entered. Um, and then the last thing is, let me see, I don't have a screenshot of that, but the last thing is if you're looking at it from a um, from an error report, then that policy did not download. So you want to make sure that you have it resent either through Ivan's or through um, in the procedures area, there's a download results page that has a recall button. You can highlight that policy recall. I think I have screenshots in here. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the commission agreements. And we're going to go right back over to there to um, Epic. So we have put in Burns and Wilcox, and we want to enter commission agreement. This is super basic. Don't overthink it. You just want your um, you just want the um, the percentage to be an an estimate. You don't have to. A lot of times agencies get bogged down in um, in trying to see well what do we get new and then if they bundle and how Epic. Epic doesn't always know if they're bundling or not or whatever. Just take a look at your commission statement or have your accountant give you just an average commission. If it's if it's significant, like workers comp, you know, is 7% and everything else is 15, then you can split it out that way. Um, but all I did, you, I'm sorry? You just triggered every OCD person attending this. I know, I know. But well, these commission percent, <laughs> These commission percents that we're going to enter in, let's find a, let's find a person. Let's go to Bernie. Um, we promise there's, there's a reason. We yes. Promise. This is, this is for your estimated, your estimated commission in your book of business report. So it doesn't have to be accurate. That was like the most freeing piece of information that anybody ever told me was just estimated. Most of them are average of 12, stick a 12 in. But um, rather than just entering it in, we, we always advise that you enter it in on the line, not on the policy. Um, enter your premium um, on the front line. Let the, cal let the, um, the uh, calculator uh, utility is what I'm trying to think of, the premium commission calculation utility. Let that run for you. That is in configure and policy. Um, and then the the um, commission premium calculation, turn that on to run right after your download and it will take your estimated premium, will give us a nice expensive auto policy, lots of teenagers. Um, it will actually calculate this by reading this, this um, percentage. Um, you don't have to click calculate if you're nosy, you click calculate, um, but you want, you're putting your commission agreements in here so that you don't have to, data enter every time that it's it's just consistent um if you've got something you got a new versus a renewal it'll it'll read the status code that's why your status codes are so important i'm getting like way off track though i am a data person and i love making your data clean i live for it all right so what we want to do is we want to come back over to the commission section and you just click plus and if you don't need any filter, if you're just putting in a generic 12% for everything, just open through open, standard commission, and there you go. A lot of times, though, I see agencies want to put in 15% um, for new and 10% for renewal, and they say, okay, this is new commission, this is new business, and they put in their 15%. And then they go on, but they haven't told Epic to look for new business. So when you come over to the checkbox, you're going to have a drop down and you're, it's going to pick the top one, whichever is in alphabetical order, and you're going to miss out on, on that. So if you're, if you're limiting workers comp, new business versus renewals, whatever, make sure you tell Epic up here. You need to select your line of business um, or select Let's show, I'll show you the new and renewal. Um, you want to make sure that you select um, not just new business, but your new business quotes. So that's on there when you enter your policy and you check the box. And if you're using this one-time policy status, which is 
fantastic. It keeps it off of your um, renewal list, you know, like your special events, things like that, to make sure that you get that as well. Um, this is new business to the carrier, so you also want uh, rewrites on, on the carriers. If you're doing this for producers, you want to include rewrites with renewals. Um, so then you just do that. You finish it up, and it's on there. Oops, I did not. I told it. I just want it to be uh, um, premium payable in this case. Okay. What did I miss, Lauren? I don't think, I, th I think you're good to go. Um, okay. That is a very simple commission agreement. Um, yeah. And it is definitely different for your brokers versus your companies um, because we're not going to be, you know, we're not going to be using that receivable or commission payable option on this one. So keeping okay. it just with the premium payable, um, make sure that it only shows up with that, in that one area. So then your users can't mess up and select that broker from, you know, the PRBR tab. We would never want that to happen. Um, so just make sure that it's showing up in the right place. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have a couple of quick questions. Uh, oh, sure. One quick question is, is there an issue by choosing not to identify the billing company PPE um, when you're entering an issuing company? Um, yes, kind of, maybe, and no. So that answer is, <laughs> that's a double-sided answer. Um, if the issuing company, it doesn't live under um, an actual company, like a, like a Travelers or Progressive or something like that, if it's like a Lloyd's, and it's always going to be brokered business, then no, you can't put a billing company in for that. So if it's if it's a company that's issuing, but it's only going to be issued by brokers, you can't connect those two together. So yeah, you just leave leave the billing company off of those. Um, but if they, they really do have a billing company, yeah, I would highly recommend making sure that you get those filled in because then it just defaults for the user that's entering in the policy. And there's no question about it. So it just happens. We take clicks away. We keep clean data. And, and it's a lot nicer. Yes. Um, yeah. So let's see. I think that is good for now. So we should keep moving on. Okay. Sound good? Yep. Yeah. And we did the commission agreements. Um, so let me just show you briefly the error, the, the com log error reports. Um, if you're not getting these and running these every day, just have them run and um, just email them to yourself and you'll come in first thing in the morning. You've got six emails, check them all, make sure they're fine. They're mostly blank, but every once in a while, this is what it looks like. You'll see no batch back company found. This means that this NAIC code has not been entered. So what you would do is you would enter this code. Um, I go to the NAIC website. Um, and then go and see if that carrier has been entered in um, in my EPIC database. If it has, if it hasn't, then you enter it. If it has, then it means that this code has not been entered on the um, configure interface company broker section. So you would just enter that there. Um, and let's see. Ah, here's my screenshot. So when you when you get it all fixed, you're going to go to interface management and the procedures area. And instead of assigning items in suspense, you're going to go to download results. You um, you can look through, you know, through today or you can do a custom session. I just want to see policies. Here's my policy that failed. I'm going to click on it and then I'm going to click recall. And then that will just send with the next download. So if um, if you don't have read a, read a, ready access to your Ivan's Exchange account, then um, you can certainly recall it just straight from Epic, but you could also go to Ivan's Exchange as well. And then here's what it looks like when a broker fails, and I'll give you this NPN number, and then you just go enter it on the broker account. All right, Lauren, I've not left much time for you. Oh my goodness, that's okay. <laughs> Nobody really wants to know accounting stuff anyways, right? <laughs> It's just me that geeks out over those things. <laughs> All right, then I'm taking over. Let me grab uh, my screen share here and let's jump into GL sub account. So um, the, <laughs> we have noticed uh, if over 
the past year or two or so that um, more and more agencies are having duplicated sub accounts um, in their GL chart of accounts. So we thought it'd be a really great idea to kind of go over this area um, so that you can check and see if you have this problem, diagnose it, and then clean up going from going forward. Uh, so first question is, how do duplicate sub accounts occur? Uh, so GL sub accounts, if you remember earlier from our conversations about adding companies, are automated gener automatically generated in the chart of accounts when a company is entered or um, as a billing company or a broker is entered as a premium payable company. Um, that automatically is going to generate that GL sub account. Actually, the broker will generate one regardless of what you select. <laughs> so that's just a good example. Um, the thing that a lot of agencies we find are missing when they're doing company cleanup is also going over to the chart of accounts and cleaning up that, that sub account. So uh, all of those are hanging out there under your direct bill income or your direct bill commission receivable or many other different areas. Um, and it's, very possible that you could select the wrong GL sub account. We don't want to do that. So if you inactivate the company or the broker because there was a duplicate situation or whatever the case is, that doesn't talk to your GL sub accounts. It just inactivates the, inactivates the company or broker um, itself. So um, we do find that a lot of times this, this occurs, you know, if maybe something was missed when you migrated on the old new list, um, maybe something got brought over as billing and it shouldn't have been brought over as billing, or maybe, you know, Jenny said earlier, like a broker was entered as a company and they should have been entered as a broker. Um, so what um, you might also have done is not known that checking the billing <laughs> checkbox creates a GL sub account. Um, so when you added a company, you might have learned later that, oh, that shouldn't have been a billing company. So you uncheck the box. So we can't use it as a billing company anymore, but we still have a GL sub account. So um, you'll notice here, and we, we looked at some of these little areas earlier, uh, checking the box, ooh, checking the box for billing. Um, on the company level or having your um, check boxes selected on the broker, once that's active, those are going to create your GL sub accounts. Now, um, why is cleanup important? I don't know. I mean, they're just hanging out there. They're not hurting anybody, are they? Yes. Yes, they can absolutely hurt your accounting functions. Um, when you're processing receipts and disbursements in the general ledger, typically you're going to select a sub account for the carrier or broker that you are paying or receiving money from. There is always going to be a sub account associated with those. Um, so you want to make sure that it's correct. And if you're like us, and you like to type instead of going to a drop down and selecting one and all that good stuff, you might just start typing in a code and maybe Epic picks the wrong code because it just fills it in for you. So if that happens, now you've deposited or dispersed something and tied it to the wrong GL sub account. So when you go to look at your status of accounts and you're trying to get totals of you know, commissions or anything like that, you're gonna have a conflict there. Um, and accounting functions in Epic that happen automatically could also be building balances in a different sub account. So, for example, if you're on an accrual method, um, then you would be generating a direct bill commission receivable. And every time that balance happens, it's hitting the GL sub account based on the policy that was transacted. So, when you do that, if you deposit to the wrong GL sub account, you've still got that balance hanging out in your direct bill commission receivable. So it's really important to make sure that those, those are correct and accurate. Um, I'm sure you can only imagine the nightmare if it was different on the policies and then you generate balances there too and they're in two different buckets and holy mackerel, where do we put those two different buckets? So <laughs> I think we're kind of understanding why it's so important to clean up. <laughs> Um, then a couple of other things that you'll note uh, or you'll notice is that agency bill transactions are also going to populate balances and sub accounts. Um, so they're going to populate, you know, your company payable, your premium payable, and it's hanging out in that account. So when it goes, comes time to clear those accounts, if we deposit something incorrectly, like I said, to the wrong one, you just end up with crazy balances everywhere. So 
Um, oh, last piece here. If you are in a company versus broker situation, meaning I deposited money to um, Burns and Wilcox as the broker, but Burns and Wilcox as the company is what's set up on all of my policies and transactions, then I'm not going to be able to associate that deposit of commission from Burns and Wilcox, the broker, I'm not going to be able to associate that to the company because they don't, they're not the same entity and you can't do that. Epic just says, no, eh, eh, sorry, you can't do that. So um, all good reasons to make sure that your, your chart of accounts and companies are correct for uh, accounting purposes. So where do you get started cleaning up? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. Uh, this can be somewhat overwhelming. So understand that if you ended up with a whole lot of duplicates that had to be cleaned up. Um, so to find out where you have duplicates uh, or sub-accounts that should be inactivated, um, you can locate them in configure. Make sure you change your view to all. So the reason why I changed my view to all is because there are sub-accounts that are the same across different areas of your chart of accounts. So you've got traveler's asset accounts, traveler's liability accounts, traveler's income accounts. So just go ahead and sort to all so that our filter to all so that you can see everything in one place. Then what I do is I go and um, sort by either the code or the description, the sub account code or the description, just so that when I generate an Excel spreadsheet, everything will kind of be put, put together there. Um, and then you can generate an Excel spreadsheet so that you can start sorting and filtering. Um, <clears throat> over in Epic though, uh, let me show you what that looks like in real life, not just screenshots. Uh, so if we go to configure, this is where we would change our chart of accounts to all. And then I can do a sort by description and you see all of the 21st centuries are together or all of the aces are together, all of the etnas are together. You get the drift. So what you would wanna do is identify, are there duplicates? So um, I'm going to show you an example of travelers. So let's go to travelers. All right, now I just typed TRA on my keyboard and it takes me down to the first TRA in the list. Shortcut, pro tip, better use that one. Um, especially when you're dealing with this many codes. <laughs> so here you can see, yes, there are clearly two types of travelers in my GL sub accounts. Now I should only have one. So at this point I have to figure out which one's the right one. So <clears throat> to do that, probably going to have to communicate, you know, with whoever's entering receipts in the system. You're going to need to find out which um, premium payable entity of these two is being used most often on policies, because you might have some, some cleanup to do on the company side as well. Um, you can also look, and I think we showed you this earlier, but you can also look on the company itself uh, and see where the sub account is located. So um, if you look here, you'll see that there's there's two different sub accounts. Pay no attention to the accounts themselves. Those are all required accounts. They happen naturally in Epic. You're going to have lots of them. That doesn't mean they're duplicates. That's just, just the automatically generated ones that happened when you put in a billing company. So here we can see that these are our two different codes. And on the billing tab of the company screen, um, you'll see the GL sub account. So if you go to the one that is truly your billing company, you want to look at that GL sub account, and that is that's your main one. That's the one you want to keep. Everything else you're going to have to get rid of it. Um, one thing that several of our very smart attendees today have noted is that it's a good idea to identify your premium payable entities in Epic by using something like all caps or even uh, I think one user said that they put a Z in their premium payable codes so that they can you know quickly see that those are definitely their premium payables. Now you can't do that anything like that in your sub accounts. Um, those are populated automatically. You don't have any control over those codes, but that is a great idea when you're trying to get this cleanup done to just kind of pop those out and say, yep, that's definitely my billing company. So when you go, go over here, you could say, which one is my billing company? That's the sub account I need. Um, in addition to that, once you've identified the sub accounts that you need to clean up, 
use that CSV file and start highlighting away in red and yellow and whatever colors you like. But that's why we'd say dump it into CSV because you don't want to sit and scroll through this chart of accounts all day in the configuration. Just use that Excel spreadsheet um, so you can kind of sort and filter and identify the ones that are, are incorrect. Um, you cannot inactivate a sub account that has a balance on it. So if you um, find that you can't inactivate, and Epic will tell you, and eh, you can't inactivate because there's something on this, um, then you're going to have to go pull a status of accounts report for that specific account with all of its sub accounts. Uh, sorry, change that backwards. Look for the sub account and all of its corresponding accounts. So get them all into one on the report and look and see what balance is happening there. You can use that um, status of accounts or you could use your balance sheet, run your balance sheet, um, include your sub accounts, and you can find that information there as well. You're going to have to journal entry that amount out of that GL account and sub account over to the correct GL account and sub account in order to clear that balance. Um, if it gets more complicated than that, you might just want to call us um, <laughs> because the uh, we you might find that you don't know what that balance is for and you just need it to go away. Um, so if, if it gets a little bit more complex, you know, you can always reach out to us, the experts on forensic accounting. <laughs> um, once you've cleared the balances, you have to do it individually. I know it's painful and nobody likes the fact that there's not a select multiple in the chart of accounts, but there's not. So you do have to inactivate each one of those individually once you've figured out balances and which one is the correct one that you want to keep. All right. So, um, any questions, Kelly, that we need to speak on for chart of accounts? Because that is a loaded question or loaded section, so to speak. <laughs> well, the only one that we had related to chart of accounts is uh, we had someone say, I'm seeing all employees showing up under chart of accounts. Is this normal? Yes. Yes, it is. So when an employee is added into your Epic database, that's also going to create GL sub accounts in several different places. Um, and that's because of the inner workings of Epic that happens in the background. So um, on agency bill, it's going to hit a commission payable. Um, you've got commission expense accounts, broker payables, broker expenses, um, direct bill commission receivables, all kinds of areas that it has to generate those required accounts for so that when transactions happen in your system, um, all of those things can go to the places that they're supposed to go. Um, and like a, as soon as you make a producer, you know, payable, um, you need to, it, it's going to generate those codes in your system. Um, regular employees too, because, you know, you might break down something by, um, by their, their codes on a, a journal entry for payroll or something to that extent. So there's definitely always gonna be employees listed in there. Yep. Cool. All right, fantastic. So um, you gave me more, more time than uh, I thought, Jenny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a really fast talker. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to go ahead and that is that's all for all of the fun stuff as far as, you know, things that we recommend to get you started on cleanup. So what are some of the next steps that you might want to take uh, to get this project started? Uh, so we definitely recommend my clicker will work um, <laughs> that you run some reports to identify the issues with the companies and brokers. So just like Jenny went over earlier, um, you know, run some of your active company reports. Um, if you're savvy with, with reports, you can pull some additional details in there. Um, you can run commission agreement reports as well. Um, all of those are found in your, your main account reports in Epic. Um, but reports is really where you're going to want to start. Figure out what companies are correct, what you should be moving to, um, and you know, look at book of business reports to see if you have a ton of issuing companies and premium payable companies that are the same. Um, so reports is a good place to start. Then you're going to need to plan your priorities because um, certain things can affect other areas. So you know, look at your 
billing companies with the NAIC codes and interface. That's where you could build out a lot of the issuing companies that you need, get that start working pretty quickly. Uh, make sure that you correct your duplicates or, or your issuing and premium payable company settings at the company or broker level. Um, and then once you do that, don't forget to fix your chart of account sub accounts. Um, last step of this, which we had a lot of questions about, I wish there was an easier way, but a lot of this cleanup does have to be done at the client level. Um, you're, so you're gonna have to engage your staff to make sure that premium payable companies are changed to what they should be or issuing companies will be changed if it's not policy download. Issuing companies are being corrected at renewal or when the policy is touched so that your data is accurate going forward. Um, that's probably the most painful part of the process because it is a lot of work. So, um, and you have to run reports consistently to make sure that that data is, is getting cleaned up. All right, um, how can we help? Well, I already told you that we are forensic accounting experts, so we can certainly help with that piece. Um, but we offer a couple of different things to, to help agencies work through some of these issues like this. Um, we offer an in-depth agency consulting EPIC assessment where we look at what your needs are, um, identify what issues you might have in your data, and we provide some recommendations for next steps moving forward based on that in-depth assessment of your system. We also, of course, help with project planning and management. So we can assist with, um, with helping you set up this plan, finding the problems, things like that. Um, or you can say, hey, can you just clean this up for me? <laughs> we'll be the cleaners. Jenny loves cleaning up data. <laughs> Love it. Um, and of course, we can also help with communication to staff and training, um, ensuring that your staff are entering things in the right place, um, making sure that they understand the difference between an issuing company and a billing company and so forth. You also can get access to an EPIC virtual administrator. So if you are low on bandwidth for a controller position or an EPIC operations person within your agency and you need some help, we can be that person for you. Um, Check-ins that are offered monthly are available, uh, quarterly check-ins, mini assessments are included in that, running reports, making sure that you get the information that you need as well. And then lastly, once we clean up all of this stuff and we tell everybody what they're supposed to do, <laughs> We would do uh, targeted auditing uh, along with refresher training, which is a fantastic way to ensure that your investment in your data and your system and your workflows, ensure that all of those things are being done regularly and correctly in your system. And then also that would be um, followed up with refresher training for anybody who doesn't meet the bar. All right, so Jenny, uh, I'm gonna pass it back to you because you've probably had a chance to take a look at a few more questions. Uh, we only have about six questions left, so we will go ahead and finish those up and let you guys go for the day. So um, if you have other questions, feel free to jump in there. Um, and Jenny, let's see, what do we have left? And Kelly. Well, we did have one related to uh producer, I'm sorry, not producer, uh, carrier broker agreements. Uh, and uh, they asked, what if you don't select the agreement type and leave all of those boxes unchecked? All of the boxes checked? Mm -hmm. Or checked, I'm sorry, yes, checked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the, um, the agreement's gonna show up in PRBR um, tabs. So we don't want to see that in the PRBR, it's not related to PRBR. Um, so we just, just, just wanna make sure that that um, information doesn't come over and it matches what's on your, your main broker screen. Um, I don't, I would have to test it. I don't think it will show up if you don't mark the broker as a commissionable, commissionable broker. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but but you just wanna keep that, that configuration aligned. So just to make sure, absolute sure, keep it clean. Great. And what does it mean on the com log when it shows uh, unprocessed, not configured? Ooh, good question. I have not seen that before. I haven't either. 
Um, you know what, actually, that might be one of those errors that is because it's something that Epic doesn't do. I know there are a few functions that some carriers send um, over through download, but there's no way to configure them in Epic and Epic can't accept um, that specific function. Uh, I, it's so long ago that I can't tell you exactly what it was, <laughs> but I think it was something, one that I, heard, I knew of was progressive. Um, but I would definitely reach out to, to applied support to figure out if that's something that is a, it could be a known issue. We, we find all of the time that there's some weird things happening in download that are known issues by applied and they're like, oh yeah, well, that's going to be fixed later. So um, it's, I would probably go directly to apply just to confirm what the issue is there. Um, okay. I'm sorry, Denise, I am not familiar with J.E. Brown. So I'm not sure if they are a parent company, unfortunately. Um, that might be something that you want to check with your, your accounting folks on to see if, um, if they're the billing, if they're the issuing, how they're really set up. Um, all right. In configure, we have a question from Andre. Um, in configure, I have gone there to add it, but there isn't an add button. Um, that could be a security issue. Uh, Jenny, let me, um, do you have Epic up? I, I do. Let's go into um, account. And let's see, what I was looking for was the uh, identification codes. Oh, darn. So, um, Andrea, I apologize. I thought this was one of those areas where you could just add stuff and it just had the option to validate or not validate. But nope, it's not you, it's me. Uh, you <laughs> unfortunately cannot add things there. So, Andrea's original question was um, where you put the, the company or broker code, like your agency identifying code for that company or broker. Um, I think she had mentioned that they are using comments now. And I do see that as one of the most commonly used. Um, contacts is another option um, because you can also see when that was last updated. So you could put it in, in either location. All right. And let's see, we have, are there best practices for maintaining AM best ratings? Um, well, you want to make sure that you're signed up to get the alerts that tell you when those ratings are changed. Um, so that would be number one for sure. Um, <clears throat> and as far as best practice is concerned, uh, again, I don't, I don't see all agencies utilizing um, putting in the AM best rating into Epic, but it definitely is great to have that information in your system. Um, you just have to make sure that you're you're keeping it up to date. So if you get a notification you need to put that information in right away uh, because you don't want to have that inaccurate data in your system. Um, so some agencies opt to not do that because they don't want to take the chance that the, the, the data would be inaccurate. Woo, can't talk anymore. All right. Oh, and I think, let's see, did I just answer that one? Is there a special place you put your agency codes? Um, and do you only enter it on the PPE companies? Yes, to your second question, because I did not answer that one yet. Um, but uh, yeah, comments or, or contacts for the, the agency code itself. All right, wonderful. So, and then we have one last question from Carla. We will um, certainly, we will certainly send that to you. She's just asking for a, a example on how a new carrier ICO and broker commission and commission agreements should be set up. Yes, we can absolutely send you some screen jots. All right. So I don't want to keep everybody too much longer today. I know we've got still still got a big crowd that's hanging out. Uh, we appreciate hat. We appreciate you spending your afternoon with us. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Lauren and Jenny, for a great presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined us today and for the submitting questions. We hope you found today's session valuable. And like Lauren said, please complete the survey at the end. Uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback. And if you'd like to learn more about Kite Tech's IT and consulting services, reach out to us on any of the ways that you see listed here. So thank you again for joining us. You will get the recording in just a few days, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.